This spotlight brought to you by Beacon Plumbing. Thanks for joining us. I'm David Rose. We kick off the spotlight with an exclusive, a strange twist in a crime caught on camera, a sadistic stabbing on a bus ride from hell. This all went down at the Mount Baker Transit Center in Seattle. And what's different about this attack is that detectives aren't searching for the suspect. They know who he is. They need your help to find the victim who left a trail of blood behind. Watch as a man with what appears to be a significant limp boards a bus on the 7 line in Seattle last summer and sits towards the middle section. He's followed by the suspect wearing a black hat with a red bill. He goes to the back of the bus, but the two then start to exchange words. At one point, the suspect appears to be reaching for something under his jacket. He retreats. Open the back door! Open the back door! But then he comes back and punches the victim. Then he exits the bus through the back door. Seconds later, though, he re enters from the front pushes past a man in a mobility scooter who is trying to get off and escape the madness. And then the two guys start in again. The suspect pulls out a knife with a nine inch blade and starts stabbing him. Detectives say this victim showed some skill at defending himself, taking the cuts to his arm rather than his vital organs. Oh God! Oh God! He's stabbing him! He's stabbing him! Oh. Passengers scramble for safety. The suspect walks off the bus and leaves. A woman who had fled the chaos doesn't want to be stuck outside with him, so she tries to get back on the bus. What did you get off for? Because he was acting like he was Well, then stay out. What the How is that my fault, dude? What the Well, because you're holding up the process. Trying to get out of here, man. With the bus now rolling, the victim is sitting in the back holding his bleeding left forearm. The bus heads north on Rainier Avenue South. When it stops on South Walker Street, the victim gets off. Detectives say they have identified the suspect as 28-year-old Elijah Pearson. He is in the King County Jail. But to get felony assault charges on this case to stick, they say they really need to speak with the victim. He didn't stick around, and he never called 911 for help, so they don't know his name. Detectives say they even asked the state crime lab to test his blood against the CODIS database, but the request was denied due to privacy concerns. We want him to know that we want to bring him the justice that, that uh, he so much deserves, and uh, but we're going to need his help to do that. So we're asking any persons, please take a look at these photos, and if you can help identify this subject, like, please contact us. This violent attack is eerily reminiscent of another stabbing on a King County Metro bus in SeaTac early Thanksgiving morning in 2020. Detectives are still trying to identify this suspect in the Nike shoes with the pink logos. He stabbed the victim multiple times, severing an artery. That bus rider is only alive because deputies stopped the bleeding with a tourniquet. Two vicious attacks on the bus caught on camera. King County Sheriff's Office and our detectives, uh, we want to make Metro the safest system we can. The criminals know exactly how to work the system in their favor. But now, Seattle police say it's a new day, launching an undercover sting operation to stop prolific thieves. Our spotlight crew was there after officers say a guy stole tools from a Lowe's in Rainier Valley before jumping into a getaway car driven by a woman who took off like a bat out of hell with a baby on board. Officers were right behind them until they finally pulled over. He just he's not in total but no, I don't want the person. Well, then how am I going to recover the stolen property I have Huh? Uh -huh. What did you say? The stolen property in your vehicle. We know this because we watched you guys come in there. Are you going to give us consent to recover it? Then you want to search the whole car. I have an idea what your drug of choice is, so no, I do not want to search your whole car. It's your gun, huh? Can I just, can I just pull it on with you? Nope, you're in the English. You can on handcuff me. Nope, not going to happen. I don't have a lot of options for how I can get that property out. Getting your consent I, to take the to property allows me to leave the car here. You're gonna take me to jail? 
I don't know. What's your concern with seeing the property on the side? Uh, we can see it then. Huh? We can see the property in there, right? Yeah. What's your concern with us going in there? Like you said. Like what? Are you your familiar? I don't want your We're paraphernalia. We're not concerned about your paraphernalia. Do we look like narcotics detectives to you? No, we're not. Correct. I don't know what to do. I want to be 100% honest with you. Okay? But here's, here's my option. Look at me. Don't look back there. Look at me. I can tow that vehicle to a tow lot and apply for a warrant, which could take days. Or... I can search it on your consent to recover that stolen property. These are my two options. I mean, I'm giving you all, all my cards on the table. You guys, I guess you can take the stolen property out, but nothing else. That's all I'm asking you. I mean, you can take the stolen property out. So I have your consent and your vehicle and recover the stolen property? Just the stolen property, yes. Yes? Okay. Only the stolen property. Uh, these, uh, too, they yeah. said pillows too, yeah. <laughs> oh, got it? Yeah, I got it. Uh, is it that, that pillow and that pillow? Oh, hey, matching set. I'll always my baby here. I'll never do it again. <laughs> sure hope not. Let's go see your baby in the time. Oh. One thing you put yourself in there, it's another thing you put your baby in there. I watch your head when you step in. You'll be an audio and video recorded by you in the control car. I'm going to see you once you get while that was all going down, our second spotlight crew was on a sting at the Home Depot on Aurora Avenue North when a call came over the radio about a stolen car nearby. So the unit's uh, responding to that number, but it's not stolen to be up just after officers cuffed the suspect, where our camera caught him trying to pull one of the oldest tricks in the perp playbook. Hi sir, I'm Sergeant Booker, the senior officer, please audio video recorded. Has anyone read you your Miranda warnings? Do you understand your rights? Okay. Right, do you understand why you're under arrest right now? Okay, you're under arrest for eluding possession of a stolen vehicle. You don't appear to be, but are you sick or injured? Listen closely. Oh. Swallow some dope. Uh, let's get medics here. Any other thing? All right. You have any questions for me? The man tells officers that he swallowed some dope. He's hoping they'll take him to the hospital, playing the odds that police don't have the staffing to guard him for hours while he gets checked out. Then he can give medical staff the slip. Welcome back. The Spotlight is learning new details about a wild carjacking and car crashing spree in Snohomish County. Detectives telling us fentanyl likely fueled the madness and the victims who came face to face with the suspect are lucky things didn't turn out even worse. Joy Salvador is a good person who looks out for others. I wanted to help because that's me, who I am, and it's also I'm in healthcare and I wanted, you know, it's part of my life. That's why she stopped after the driver of this stolen black Chevy Cruze almost killed her in a head on collision. I don't even know how I managed to swerve out of the way. The Chevy smashed into the car next to Joyce. It was awful. It was like watching a movie. A car was coming in my direction head on and hit the truck next to me. And I swerved out of the way and the car hit the guardrail. Her medical training kicked in right away. He hit so hard I knew that somebody had to be hurt. So I pulled my car over off to the side, um, grabbed my phone, and I ran over there to see if somebody was hurt. Um, and the, got, the person that crashed the car got out of the car and he covered his face up and he walked across Highway 9 and disappeared. Joyce went to check on the people in the truck and called 911, staying with the crash victims as they waited for help to arrive. A few minutes later, the man who ran off after the crash reappeared. 
He was on something and he covered his face up when he got out of the car and never said a word to anybody and just walked across Highway 9. Joyce didn't know it at the time. Not only was she right about him being on something, detectives who were trying to identify this guy tell the spotlight that they found suspected fentanyl and paraphernalia in his car. And in the back seat, a butcher's knife with the handle wrapped in tape. I had left my car running because I wanted to make sure people were okay. And he got in it and he drove away with my purse and everything in there. I ran after the car and I was screaming, but he was gone. He, he went so fast. The fentanyl fueled madness was just the beginning. About 45 minutes later, cops called Joyce. Good news. They found her stolen Subaru. He took my favorite car away and it's a Subaru and you know, it was it was a good little vehicle. I love that thing. But bad news, Joyce. It wasn't how you left it. He had um, sideswiped another car. The back tire fell off. Then he crashed my car into a tree, and that's someone's family room. He just missed it. Odds are high this lawbreaker was not wearing a seatbelt and cracked the windshield with his cranium. But it doesn't seem to have knocked any good sense into him. He ran from Joyce's mangled ride and hopped a fence. You can hear a homeowner telling the drugged up derelict to beat it. Hey, hey, you can't go there. Hey, right here. Right here. Hey, what are you doing? You can't go there. Hey, you can't go there. By this point, deputies are closing in. Their flashing lights visible in the distance as this human crash test dummy prowls for his next set of Hot Wheels. It was cold and icy that morning. He spots a Chevy Traverse warming up, hops in and speeds off, managing to make it to Bothell before suddenly veering off the road and crashing for the third time in one day. Another good Samaritan, also driving a Subaru, Amanda Desharis was right behind him. In an email to the spotlight, she says she stopped to help him. As she approached the wreck, he crawled out of the passenger side and climbed into her car. When she confronted him, she says he begged her to take him to a hospital or a bus stop to get help. But then he just sped off, eventually crashing her car into another vehicle in Shoreline. Amanda says, this guy ruined a lot of lives. I was so blessed that I had just dropped my son off at daycare and he wasn't in the car. But all of us had our lives turned upside down and he deserves to be caught. Joyce is also angry, but says it won't keep her from stopping to help the next crash victim. Except this time, she will remember to kill her ignition and lock her car doors. I'm really surprised he didn't kill anybody and thank God he didn't. Inquest hearings into police shootings have started up again in King County after a series of challenges to the state Supreme Court. And they began with one of the last police shootings in Seattle before body cameras were rolled out across the department. This week, a jury unanimously ruled that four Seattle police officers were justified in the shooting of Demarius Butts in 2017. Butts was 19 at the time of the shooting. He and his sister stole beer and donuts from the 7-Eleven in Pioneer Square, while an accomplice waited down the street. According to Butts' sister, the clerk grabbed her on the way out. That's when Butts pulled up his shirt and showed the clerk he was packing. The trio stopped around the corner to have a smoke when officers showed up. The third man took off running with the goods. Cops grabbed Demarius. His sister says she clocked the officer with a bottle so Demarius could break free. He then hightailed it into the loading dock of the federal building. Seattle police didn't wear body cameras in 2017, but we do have dash cam footage of them arriving on the scene as Butts runs into the federal building and audio of what happens next. SPD says Butts opened fire first with a 38 caliber pistol. A gunfight ensues. Butts fired four shots, hitting three officers, one in the bulletproof vest, another in an officer's face. The third had a bullet graze his hand. Butts was shot 11 times. The officers said they thought Butts might head into the federal building and turn the ordeal into a hostage situation. The most critical thing in my mind is he's going to shoot again. And I've got to make sure that Liz is okay behind cover. I've got to make sure that I'm okay. 
But then we have to start thinking about, is he going in further? Is he taking a hostage? This is the first inquest in King County since 2017. <laughs> County Executive Dow Constantine issued executive orders in 2018 to overhaul the process, kicking off a series of challenges in the state Supreme Court. The changes were upheld last year. There are six other inquests on the docket, including Charlena Lyles. Lyles was shot in June of 2017. A month later, then-Mayor Ed Murray signed an executive order requiring SPD officers to wear body cameras. I have to inform you, you're being audio video recorded. Because of the federal consent decree, SPD typically releases body cam footage within 72 hours, like this shooting from earlier this month outside of the Social Security office. Surveillance footage showing a man with a gun firing shots into the air after ramming through the gates with his truck. 921, what is your emergency? There's an active shooter on 2nd and Marion. Hey, back up, back up, back up, back up, you two, back up, you two, back up, you two, back up. Body camera footage shows officers issuing the man warnings. What is that? Put your hands up! Hands up! Yeah. Yep. Put your hands up! Drop it now! Drop it! Don't, Don't do it! it! Don't! Telling him not to shoot himself. He's trying to shoot himself in the head. The man then stands up, rifle in hand, and aims at officers who open fire. Put it down now! Body cameras are something new King County Sheriff Patty Cole Tindall wants to see her department deploy. But she says there are some concerns from the community. So we just completed a 90-day pilot on body cam. So we had about, I believe it was 10 officers. We had um, a couple of cameras in our cars and then 10 officers wearing the actual body cams. And the experience was positive from our officers. Roll the window down. Where we are at right now is uh, we have a number of things that are happening. We owe a report to the executive and council about the results of that pilot. And then as part of that, we also need to have a draft policy that we would want to implement here at the sheriff's office. Now, nationally, there are some best practices around body cam policy. And um, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We need to look at what that, those best practices are and see what we may want to implement here. The other thing we need to do is engage with the community. We know that community has some concerns about what might go in that policy, so that's other work that still would need to happen. It seems to many people, including me, that it would be a, a no-brainer, but there are some people that kind of question the use of body cameras. Yes. What hurdles are you running into? Well, I think uh, we have a number of community groups who want to meet and discuss the, the use. One thing would be uh, the ability for officers to review the footage before making a statement. So there are some best practices and whatever policy we come up with, we would want to ensure that it mirrors best practices in the industry. Let's boil down. So the officer would write their report. Yes. Then they would have the ability to go back and view the video. Right. And then add an addendum, not change correct. the report, but add that an would addendum. Be correct. And this is what's done in yes. almost all departments, yes, right? Yes, it is. But there are some groups that feel that that's not fair. Right. I think they have concerns about it. So they want us to be able to have a conversation, engage, hear their concerns, and basically comment on the draft policy. And we're working with the Office of Law Enforcement Oversight as well on this. So it's a, it's a group effort. So, you know, this is the natural process. I mean, body cams are, I think, something that both our deputies and the community would want, but we need to make sure we're doing it in a thoughtful way. What's a good example of how the body cams were useful in the trial run? Well, I think being able to show, I mean, many times we get complaints from uh, suspects or subjects that we come in contact with and they say a certain thing happened and you know uh, having a body cam it's right there what really happened and so we do know that sometimes the body cam I mean it's it, it tells the story so I believe that's one reason the officers are really supportive of it um, so it, it, it in several instances it showed exactly what happened and the individuals involved in the incident, so not only the deputies but the subjects, they know it's being recorded, right, or learn that it is. So that potentially may cut down 
on the number of complaints that we receive, or at least provide clarity. If there is a complaint, you know, let's go and review the video. Police body cams capture all kinds of interactions, not just crime. Take a look at the tense moments during this winter's cold snap when officers in Seattle pulled up to a man on fire and his RV seconds away from exploding. It happened in Georgetown, just off South Albro Place by I-5. Police pulling up on a snow-covered street just before 4 a.m. Flames ripping through an RV as a couple uses snow to try to extinguish the flames on the RV's owner. Officers pulling the man to safety as they tried to battle the fire with an extinguisher. It didn't work. An explosion ripping through the trailer. The man taken to Harborview with serious burns. That's all the time we have on this edition of The Spotlight. And as you've seen, the cameras are always watching. So until next time, be smart and stay safe.